this idea that Russia has a voice, has a, something to say to the rest of the world and can be leading part of the world. And that's a very ancient notion that you had in the the Byzantine legacy of uh, uh, Russia, so in the Orthodox tradition. But also, if you read Dostoevsky, there was also this idea that Russia will be able to help create a kind of new universalism where all human beings will realize they are part of the same, you know, humankind. So Hello and welcome to Unheard. I'm Freddie Sayers. The war in Ukraine is being described so much as a power battle, realpolitik, one empire against the other. There's very little philosophical in it. What we want to ask today is what are the philosophical roots of this clash? Are there things about Russia, philosophically and ideologically, that are different from the West? And in particular, how should we understand the thinking of a certain person called Alexander Dugin? He is a philosopher, he was once described as Putin's brain, and he's one of the most controversial thinkers to come out of Russia. The person who knows most about him, perhaps in the whole world, is an academic called Marlene Laruelle. She is at George Washington University in DC in the United States, and she joins us now to tell us about him. Hi Marlene. Hello. So you are pretty much the world expert in the works of Alexander Dugin. You just published a book called Is Russia Fascist? Um, which is all about Dugin and thinkers like him. So I guess the, the first question has to be, this man, Alexander Dugin, we've seen, he's, there are YouTube videos of him. He, he encapsulates a view of kind of Russian nationalism and a, a kind of clash of civilizations, as he sees it. How would we begin to understand the world as Mr. Dugin sees it? Yeah, he's really rooted in very classic uh, uh, far-right or even fascist ideologies that really think that there are philosophical meanings to any kind of conflict. And he has been a big proponent of a civilizational reading of a world conflict. So for him, and I even wouldn't say Russian nationalism, I think it would be more a Russian imperialism vision. So for him, there exists a continent called Eurasia with Russia at its center. And this continent to survive should expand really aggressively and don't hesitate to clash with the rest of the world and especially with the, the Western world. So it's a very much a, a conflict war based a, a, a vision of civilization, a very aggressive one also with a lot of messianisms uh, uh, around, a very religious mes messianisms based on the meanings of, of orthodoxy. So it's a, it's a weird mix between kind of fascist doctrines of coming from Europe and the interwar period and the kind of Russian, uh, uh, class, more classic orthodox messianisms. So as far as Alexander Dugan sees it, what is the heart of the Russian soul? What is it that's special about the Russian civilization that is different from other civilizations? So for him, I think the core element of this Russian civilization would be to believe in an authoritarian state where the state is above the citizens, where the leader is leading the, 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 the population. Orthodoxy is also a very important element. So this idea that Russia has a very strong uh, uh, feeling of religiosity and of kind of uh, spirituality that would be clashing with the more material uh, uh, or pragmatic uh, uh, Western culture, also a cult of war, a cult of conservative values, so a cult of masculinity, traditional uh, um, uh, masculinity. So it's all these elements. So the regime is an important element, the continent, the territorial aspect of Russia. Russia has a big space. As he's saying, it's a notion coming from from uh, uh, Karl Schmitt. Russia, the big territory, like the empire and the expansion would be like the norm for an authoritarian Eurasian uh, 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 regime, as Dugin is dreaming of. So let's just dig into some of those, because that's quite a list there. So the first one is this idea of a strong leader or a being led from the top. And it does seem that there is a history of that in Russia obviously from the Tsars, then into the communist period, and now it seems to have reverted once again with Vladimir Putin. Is that true? 
Well, in the sense that Russia had always a very autocratic regime historically, yeah, of course, that's true. I mean, the way the Tsarism was thinking of its relation, the, the relationship between the Tsar and the people was always very much based on this idea that you don't need institution to represent the nation. You have a kind of direct connection between citizen and the father of the nation, the leader of the nation, the Tsar or the, the, the Soviet leader. I mean, this, I, I would put the Soviet regime in with more nuances because it was also a collegial way of managing the country. But And, and Dugin is not a nostalgic of the Soviet construction. He's a nostalgic of the Soviet Union as a big space and as a messianic regime, but not of the Soviet Communist Party per se. So it would be more about the kind of the Tsarist autocratic uh, vision and also a notion of a Führer. He was employing some kind of Nazi or fascist uh, references very open in the in the 90s is doing it less now because it's not very well received in in Russia and it's clashing with the the, the, the Russian culture. Why is it that Russia has this tendency to towards autocracy towards these very strong leaders? I mean, what what's your view on that? Is is Dugin right that it is somehow in the culture that it's perhaps such a large space or it's so disparate that? There's a natural sense that a strong leader is necessary, or as Western liberals would say, is that all nonsense and it's just an accident of history and they should be more democratic and should be less autocratic? Yeah, I think it has both, both historical explanation, just the way the Russian state was built historically over the centuries. For sure, the, the management of a big territory played a role of a huge diversity. But then I think there are also a lot of kind of sociological feature on the fact that modernity didn't reach Russia the same way it reached Western Europe. So the what is usually considered as the social groups that would be pushing for a more democratic representative regime like, uh, you know, mer merchant class the bourgeoisie, they didn't arrive in Russia the same way as in Europe. They were not stronger the same way. So the 19th century, which is the moment where in Europe, this kind of bourgeoisie is, is pushing for more representative power, didn't really work in Russia. And so Russia continued all over the 19th century to have a pretty autocratic regime. You also had Slavdom. It's an important element to remember until the the, the, the third part of the 19th century. So several elements that make that Russia being historically at the periphery of Europe didn't have the same waves of kind of modernity, both economic and political modernity arriving. So I would be more looking at this kind of structural aspect that this idea that Russia is destined to remain an autocratic regime. We in Europe like to think of Russia as sort of as European, ultimately, or, or our closest neighbor at the very least. And there are moments like the war and peace sort of time where St. Petersburg is at its uh, heyday and these palaces and it all seems very interconnected with European aristocracy. There are periods obviously like the 1990s when it was a moment of is it now going to join the kind of Western capitalist world. There have been these moments, but it never seems to really last. Do you think that's cultural? Do you see it as European or, or do you think... Dugan is right that it's actually more Asian. No, I think I think Russia is more European in, in all its cultural values on the way people, the values, the, the definition by people of well-beings, of what is they considered as being worse. It's, it's a very European based culture. But because just Russia is a huge territory geographically and politically at the periphery of Europe, it's a very difficult kind of <laughs> matchmaking between being European by culture and being European politically and, and by territory. So I think we will have to deal with that ambiguities and Russia will have to deal with that ambiguities. And when we look at sociological surveys, we see that the, the a growing part of the population does not identify as Eurasian. So all kind of Dugin's idea of uh, uh, Eurasia as being a mix of Europe and Asia that doesn't really resonate with the population. The population doesn't really care about Asia. They are xenophobic toward Muslim, toward population coming from Central Asia, the Caucasus. So they are not really kind of attracted by the South or the East, but they have a vision of Russia as its own civilization. But when you try to look at then what is that civilization, it's still a very European Christian based civilization.
Right, so you mentioned Christian there, and earlier you spoke of the importance of the Orthodox Church in Dugin's thinking, and perhaps also in Mr. Putin's thinking to some extent, the, the centrality of Ukraine and Kiev to the history of the Russian Church makes their kind of claims on that territory more vivid. Do, do you think it is still a central part of, of Russian culture? Is that as true as it ever was? And do you think that makes it different from us? No, I think it has changed a lot uh, um, compared to what it was before the, the Soviet period. And so the kind of revival of orthodoxy that we have been discussing uh, in the West these last 30 years, it's a very cultural orthodoxy revival. It's not about religion. People are not really believers. People don't go to church. Russia has a level of religious practice that is one of the lowest in Europe. It's like two to six percent going to church. Many people present themselves as orthodox. And when you ask them, do you believe in God? They said no. So it's a purely cultural national definition. So it's orthodoxy as part of your national identity. And I think that's also a large part of the way Putin is seeing it is that orthodoxy is part of yeah, this kind of what he called the cultural code of Russia. So it's much more a political or a cultural instrumentalization of religion than any kind of you know direct <laughs> belief in God, which with Dugin is different. I think Dugin is more a classic religious person than, than the Russian elites globally. But when he talks, as you mentioned, about conservative values, about masculinity, these things sound like reactions to an excess of Western liberalism, don't they? So should we read the kind of renaissance of the Orthodox, or at least interest in the Orthodox Church, as being a reaction to what seems like too much liberalism, too much openness, and, and a kind of fear of what a world without values might look like, and it's pushing back against that? Well, I would dissociate the revival of orthodoxy and the narrative on conservative values, because the revival of orthodoxy arrived early in the 90s. So as soon as the Soviet Union collapsed, even during perestroika years, this revival of interest in orthodoxy was there. So it was much more a rediscovery by Russian of their religious tradition or their cultural tradition beyond the Soviet parentheses of seven decades of atheism. The conservative values narrative is arriving later as a reaction to Western liberalism or to what the regime consider being uh, too much kind of the West normative impact on Russia. So you see the, the religious revival was there earlier as a reaction to the Soviet Union, while conservative values is a reaction to the West kind of normative impact on Russian society. Mr. Dugan talks about this idea of collectivism uh, or a, an opposition to Western individualism. That's quite a central idea of his. And I just wonder what your thoughts are about that. Do you think there's some truth in that as far as Russian culture is concerned? Are they less individualistic than we are? You know, it's always difficult to ask the question with su such terminology. But if we look at sociological surveys, yeah, we can see that the Russian societies care more about the place of the individual in the societies. Family values are more important also because in Soviet time, children were very much raised by grandparents. So you have intergenerational connections sociologically that are stronger than in the West. Family, friendship are usually rated very high in the Russian society. So you have these elements that I think we can explain because the Soviet system kind of atomized citizens and created distrust between citizens because of the political pressure and the political repression. So a way to cope with an authoritarian regime is to have horizontal solidarity. So people have a circle of trust and it's usually family, friends, and they are very loyal to these friendships over, over the years. So I think these elements are there, but I wouldn't give them a kind of, you know, philosophical meaning as Dugin is trying to do. I think it can be explained by more kind of sociological feature on the Russian societies and how it has to go through very rapid changes in Soviet time and in post-Soviet period. I mean, so, so far, you know, we've got strong leader, we've got family values, uh, thick textured society and so on. This could be said of many more traditional societies around the world, Muslim societies, Catholic ones. I still haven't got the sense of what is specifically Russian about the 
Russian soul that Alexander Dugin talks about so much. Yeah, and that's a good remark because maybe, and that's one of the points, you know, of each nationalism is that they are all very repetitive and they all, in fact, look like the same. It's just like the way they combine elements is slightly different. But it's very difficult to identify what would be the real genuine core because maybe there is none, right? Maybe, but I think the messianism aspect is an important one that you wouldn't have necessarily in uh, um, Catholicism or like if we think like uh, Latin American uh, Catholicism, for example. So what, what does that mean? This idea that Russia has a voice has a, something to say to the rest of the world and can be leading part of the world. And that's a very ancient notion that you had in the the Byzantine legacy of uh, uh, Russia, so in the Orthodox tradition. But also, if you read Dostoevsky, there was also this idea that Russia will be able to help create a kind of new universalism where all human beings will realize they are part of the same you know, humankind. So all these elements of messianism, they are there historically in the kind of the intellectual life of of, uh, of, uh, of Russia. I wouldn't say they are really influential politically because I think that would be too much to think that Putin is, has a kind of strong messianic idea. He has strong vision of Russia and what Russia should be, but not necessarily of a kind of huge kind of worldwide messianism. And what is the end game? as far as Dugin is concerned. What does the best possible world look like? Is it one where Russia has expanded and is waging these regenerative wars and succeeding in them? Is there an end game or is it just a sort of process? I think it's very much a process. The final kind of a, a, a dream that we could see in his re readings is like there will be a very strong Eurasian world that would be largely controlling Europe. The US will be limited to its own territory and maybe controlling Latin America. And then there will be an Asian and a Muslim bloc and all these kind of big continents. So like the China, India bloc, and then the Eurasia bloc would be leading and the West would be, the West would have been destroyed as the transatlantic entity. So US would be let on its continent and Europe would be under Russian influence. That's the, the final dream. It must be said that now more than ever, that doesn't sound so terribly unlikely, does it? I mean, it feels like we are entering more of a world of power blocks that are separate. I mean, all of the sanctions that have happened in the last couple of weeks will have the effect of cutting Russia off further. There are these tectonic plates moving and it almost feels like we are going towards a Dugan style world. Well, we are going toward more confrontation for sure, but where we are not going toward what Dugin's hope is to see the US retracting from Europe and to see Europe moving to the Russia under Russian influence. That I think has, has failed. And the war, in a sense, has kind of reconsolidated NATO legitimacy and the kind of US Europe commitment. Germany has been really changing its position toward Russia within the beginning of the war. So I think on that, it's a total failure of what Dugin was dreaming of, that the West is stronger, but he will be indeed more confrontational also. But there's this, the sanctions and the effect of the separation that is now happening. I mean, this is something we've been thinking about, that by cutting off the internet, by withdrawing Western brands from Russia, you know, Google Pay doesn't work in the Moscow subway anymore, you can't get a McDonald's. This is all... Good stuff, no doubt, as far as Alexander Dugan is concerned. I would imagine wherever he's sitting, he is quite encouraged by what he's seeing. Yeah, I think we have to realize that in Russia you have, I mean, around Putin and among this kind of those intellectuals or ideologists of a, a Russian kind of great powerness, you have different groups. And so Dugin is really representing the most radical groups, but also the one that want a kind of autarchic Russia. So for him, as you said, it's all good. Cutting all the kind of economic links with the West is exactly what Russia should be doing. And in fact, he has been criticizing Putin for very long, saying, yeah, he did good politically, but economically he's still too liberal and still too pro-Western. He should not be afraid to cut th these links. And so that is happening now 
because of, because of the war. So there is a whole group of people who want Russia to become autarkic. And then there is another group that think that Russia, great power, should be on the contrary, a kind of globalized, more modern or postmodern, connected to the rest of the world, great power. So this group is losing, and it's the kind of the autarkic group that is winning mm. uh, uh, now because of the, the, the sanctions. I mean, it sounds weirdly reminiscent of the Brexit conversations that we were having here in the UK for year after year, where there were the global Britain Brexiteers who wanted Britain to be separate but very connected, and then the people who were called Little Englanders or people who wanted to cut off more and live, as you say, autarkically. Maybe that's a feature of all conservative or nationalistic movements. Yeah, I think there is a, a, the feeling that globalization didn't succeed, that globalization is dangerous, that trade globalization or economic globalization also goes with normative globalization, with value globalization. So if you don't want value globalization, you should also refuse the economic globalization and kind of retract, withdraw on your own uh, territory. And of course, for Russia, that's a narrative that has existed since 19th century, this idea that Russia is so big that it has enough in itself to be functioning in a kind of self, you know, sufficiency element in terms of agricultural production, mineral production. So you have people who said that, well, some level of disconnection of Russia from the world economy can be good for Russian economy. I think it's failing now because the cut is too strong and it will be difficult for the, the Russian regimes to find enough, you know, strength at home to kind of cope. But there have been several attempt by Russia already in several years to prepare itself for, for this disconnection. So in terms of internet, in terms of banking system, they have been working hard in trying to become self-sufficient as much as they can. I don't think they, they were prepared to that level of sanctions, but they were preparing for, for kind of self-sufficiency. So where does this lead us in terms of rights and what society looks like? Because it's one thing to talk about being more true to your own culture and less globalized and cut off and autarkic, probably a lot of people in a lot of countries would be quite enthused by those ideas. But the implication in terms of rights is quite profound, isn't it? it as far as I understand it, Alexander Dugin doesn't believe in human rights at all. He thinks they're a Western invention. I'm not sure where women sit in his list of priorities and minorities generally don't seem to get much of a look in. Is that fair? Yeah, it's totally fair. I mean, his, his vision of rights is a, is a totalitarian vision is that you don't need political rights because you would, your kind of inner identity would be automatically represented by the leader and the kind of elite. So you don't need to be given this kind of normative, you know, symbolic representative uh, rights. Women would be sent back to a very traditional role of uh, procreation and taking care of, of men. Minorities, so Dugin has some respect for Muslim minorities, but at the same, they would be given right as a religious minority, but individuals themselves would be deprived. It sounds quite frightening, that future, or it sounds more like the past, I suppose. And I wonder, is it really fascism we should be talking about, which is obviously the most recent example of a, of a worldview that looked a bit like this, but... Maybe all early uh, civilizations were more like this. It sounds like the ancient Greeks. It sounds like warring empires in the Middle Ages. Is there some sense in which the world as Dugan sees it is the world that has always been before the Enlightenment and he just rejects everything that came after? Yeah, absolutely. And he belongs to that uh, philosophical or ideological movement called traditionalisms, based on René Guénon and Julius Sevola's uh, um, uh, uh, texts that really believe that indeed it's the kind of middle age, the middle age or the kind of the dreamed middle age, the middle age as they imagine it is what we should be going back to. So everything before the Renaissance and before the Enlightenment is how the world should be. I think what fascism bring in the discussion is the modernity of repressive tools, right? In that ancient world where maybe indeed you didn't have political rights in the sense we have them now, but the, the capacity to repress was also not a modern, modernized one, 
right? So, so the level of repression and of totalitarianism that you can have, it's the modernity that fascism has, has kind of brought. So it's both the kind of the dream of this kind of fascist modernity in the repression capacity, and also this dream of going back to pre-Renaissance uh, 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 Europe or world. What's difficult in this conversation, any of these kind of ideas, is that fascism is now quite rightly considered a kind of unambiguous evil, and it's it's almost a swear word. I mean, it's what you call anyone you disagree with these days. But can it be true that someone like Alexander Dugin has some things right, as well as many things wrong? You know, is it fair to say that there were things about that time of human history that we have lost and that we should think about and that we should try to you know reawaken without suddenly throwing away human rights and throwing away modern society you know and that that's why these conversations are so difficult what what are the good ideas that we should try to retrieve and try to implant in our western ways of life to make the success of that kind of alternative less likely yeah you see i think one of the problem is to- to think that it's a kind of bipolar thing, say there it's a kind of dugging type or it's the Western modernity as it is now. And I think Western modernity and Western liberalism as it is now is really getting challenged for good reasons, not the dugging ones, but for other kind of good reasons. And indeed, there will be a need for revitalizing or reinventing Western liberalism with more because I think people want more rootness, they want more kind of collective uh, 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 life, they want to know their place into a, a more value system, but that can be done with leftist ideologies, that can be done with a, a, a more classic conservative ideology. You don't need to have the Dugin's narrative to find that legitimate, right? I think the Dugin's narrative is the, really the most dangerous one we can have, but I think that. The only elements maybe where all these challengers are right is that the Western liberalism will have to reinvent itself because people need something more than just consumerism. That's for sure. But that can be a leftist reinvention of liberalism. Yes. But I guess this question of culture that he emphasizes and centers, that we're not all the same, that cultures are run very deep, and have grown over a long time and have made us into quite different types of human beings because of our cultural backgrounds. That is already very politically difficult to talk about. And actually, people don't like talking about cultures in those senses. You, you, you like celebrating differences and, and so on. But the idea that human beings feel more comfortable living in a culture which they recognize and feel rooted in is a, is a politically controversial idea these days. Uh, and maybe that's something that Western liberalism needs to grapple with better. But look, if, if you look at conservative mainstream movements, they are very much promoting that idea and they are mainstream. I mean, if you look at European reaction, for example, toward migrants, the, narr- the growing narrative like, well, migrants need to adapt, we are Europeans, we have our own roots, it can all, not all be like kind of cosmopolitanism. All these elements, they are there in the conservative mainstream, and thus they are very much already in governmental position. So I think that is coming back indeed, but in a softer, more mainstream, classic conservative narrative and not the far right one. So if we go back to Russia then, do you think what's happening now might be a turning point or it's a, a fork in the road for Russia? And do you think a more Dugin style separate civilization return to older kind of Russian ideas is one potential future? Which way do you feel it might go? Yeah, I think, I mean, what is impressive with the war now is how much by just one action Putin dramatically changed the European landscape and the futures of Europe, the future of Ukraine, of course, and its own future and the future of Russia. So suddenly he reopened new paths or new ways of imagining the future. Some people are thinking they could be a coup, you know, a kind of palace coup, and then suddenly a new Russia or a softer Russia would emerge. But you can also have the, the kind of Dugin pass, I think, has also be reopened or opened with the war that we could now imagine a very closed 
marginalized isolationist Russia that will be really kind of much more repressive. And we see that, I mean, honestly, over the last 12 days of the war, the, the level of repression in Russia has really increased dramatically. And so if that is continued to be like that, then then the Russian regimes will have to reinvent its repressive tool and its narrative about the repression and about itself. And then it will indeed move, unfortunately, closer to, to what Dugin has been uh, uh, representing. I mean, but the problem with is that Dugin is a very expansionist person, while Russia now will be in an autarchic position. I mean, except the war in Ukraine, it will be more closed and disconnected. So there are other thinkers who have been pushing for this kind of totalitarian Russia, but not an expensive one, but an isolationist one. And that's the past that seems to be, at least it's one of the future that is now really possible for Russia. And right now you're sitting in DC, they are closing Russian shops. So I mean, apparently people are cancelling reservations to Russian restaurants. Russian authors are being pulled from syllabuses. There have been stories that people won't even teach Dostoevsky in some university campuses. What is your reaction to that? What is going on there with the, the kind of extent of the Western reaction to this? Yeah, it makes me very sad because I think this demonization of Russia is not the right solution. I may understand the sanctions, but the demonization of everything Russian, I think either is sending the wrong messages to Russians because that will force them to kind of side with the regime because they will feel threatened as a nation and as a culture and kind of cancelled. And I think it should be, we should really be able to dissociate the regime from the country. And there was some yeah, good, good narrative saying uh, uh, no to Putin, but yes to Pushkin. You know, like how can we try to rethink Russia? And also because Russia is such a diverse con- country and society, there are a lot of great things that were, let's say, happening in the Russian societies unless, until the, the last Two weeks in terms of culture, you know, art, uh, 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 a lot of transformation happening among the Russian youth. So I think there are a lot of hope that were there at least until the last two weeks. And trying to demonize Russia now is kind of really taking a risk of sending everything back. Well, it sends the people into the arms of Putin where we want to be doing the reverse, I suppose. Yeah, I think on the contrary, we should be reaching out to Russians. We should be kind of embracing all the other aspects of Russian culture to try to have the regime kind of losing its own grips. And I think that would have been the best strategies. But it's so much a kind of black and white demonizing, you know, situation where Russia is really everything bad now that it will be very difficult to reverse. Marlene Laruel, thank you so much for talking to us. Thank you so much for your invitation. That was Marlène Laruelle, an academic, an expert, an analyst of philosophers like Alexander Dugin, the famous Russian nationalist and far-right thinker, whose ideas, although they may not be directly influencing Vladimir Putin at the moment, are important to understand if we're to understand the philosophical basis of what is going on in Ukraine and beyond. So thank you to her for sharing her thoughts and thanks to you for tuning in. Don't forget you can like and subscribe the channel. The buttons are just beneath me here and that will mean you won't miss a video when the new ones come out. See you next time. This was Unheard.